we will be covering Show Me the Money. Tell storytelling your way to more dollars. So Randy did a great introduction. I am Amanda Set with Rock Paper Scissors. And I'm Heather Loveridge, founder and chief storyteller of Magnolia Media Group. Um, we're a marketing agency focused on nonprofits, and we believe stories are the heart and soul of marketing. We love helping our nonprofits clients tell their story well. And one of the hats I happen to wear is that of chief storyteller for the Community Foundation, which is such a privilege of mine. All right, we do want to remind everybody that this is not just a presentation, this is a conversation. So please message us in chat uh, on, the, on Zoom. If you have questions, we will have time for uh, comments and questions throughout, uh, but we'd like to collect them and kind of work through them. So if anything pops in your head, just please post that to us and we will get to that. Just want to kind of cover what today looks like. We're going to open up with Heather talking about stories and fundraising. And we have a couple special guests to share their stories with us. I'm going to dive into content strategy and then we're going to do some breakout sessions. I want to take a second and talk about breakout sessions. So we have four uh, marketers here with us today. We have Elizabeth and Valerie as our backups um, so that we can do a little bit smaller groups to work through some of the content that we're going to talk about today in this so that you don't just have to absorb it, but you have a little bit of space to start to process it. Uh, Carol Kay sent out an email from the RPS team with some workbook information for you guys. Um, so that's one piece and then Heather and her team have some other stuff as well. And with that, I'm done with housekeeping. Awesome. Well, as the title of our webinar is Show Me the Money, we want to talk about the importance of storytelling when it comes to fundraising. Um, but before we get into that, I kind of want to set the stage um, and talk about fundraising in a pandemic, because that's just where we are. We've been living since um, early March these days. And sometimes the question is, you know, well, should we even be doing anything? Well, like our slide says, if you stop fundraising, you're guaranteed to get zero funds. Um, but, you know, if you think about that too, as you are doing fundraising, and we talk about that morphing into storytelling as well, um, you want to make sure that you're handling what you're doing with fundraising with sensitivity, caring, and grace. The last thing you want to do is be tone deaf during all this and just turn your supporters off. You may have a great story, but if you don't present it well or um, you're not careful with your words, it can negatively affect you. Uh, well, I found this quote um, from Crescendo, which they work um, with nonprofits, and they said, the keys to success are to change what you can control, focus on your mission, build excellent teams, and have great timing. And I thought that was just really appropriate for now, because there's a lot that we can control, but there's a lot that, a lot that we can't control, but there is a lot that we can control during all this. Um, and so as we think about it, Think about fundraising. You can be proactive or you can be reactive. And so today we're all about being proactive and developing the plan. And to help illustrate that, I've got a story because what storyteller doesn't have a story? Um, if you've read the book, Great by Choice, which is by author Jim Collins, he talks about the 1911 race to the South Pole. The explorers Robert F. Scott and Roald um, Emmonson had two different strategies. For Scott, if there is bad weather, he stayed in camp. Then when the weather improved, he tried to travel over 20 miles per day. But good weather or bad, the Norwegian Amundsen traveled 20 miles, no matter what. So 20 miles each day, but on December 15th, 1911, Amundsen planted the Norwegian flag on the South Pole. In the meantime, Scott's team was second and didn't return to the South Pole, but Amundsen and his team returned to a hero's welcome in Europe. And so this just helps illustrate that one of the most important things, and especially relevant right now, is just showing up and keep on doing it. So that success for them was 20 miles per day. So if you think about it, when it comes to fundraising, and then we talk about storytelling, what is your 20 miles per day goal? Do you have something you're shooting for and you're just, you know, whatever it takes, you're trying to make that goal um, each and every day and just keep on keeping on. So let's talk about, you know, we talked about fundraising in the pandemic, you know, why it's important, because if you don't keep fundraising, you're guaranteed to get zero funds. So what role does storytelling play in this? Um, if you think about it, storytelling and fundraising are both at the core about empathy. 
And sometimes, well, especially growing up, I used to think empathy was about feeling sad or having pity on someone. But in reality, it's just identifying with someone else's feelings, you know, whether those are sad or happy. And so we give money to charitable causes because we emotionally connect with the story they tell us. Um, so funny story, looking at this picture, um, as I was going through the slides, I see empathy. In fact, I, I created a story in my head to go with this picture. So here's my story. The woman with her back to us was just telling the people around her about how her cat got sick. And she took him to Dr. Wallace at Gwinnett Animal Clinic. She found out how the cat had some rare, but treatable disease, something with a strange name that we can pronounce. So the guy next to her um, goes, oh my gosh, my cat had the same exact thing and I took him to Dr. Wallace too. Are you having to do X, Y, Z as part of the treatment protocol? And immediately they connect, all because of the story she told that he empathized with. So there's that connection. That's a, a silly story, but that's kind of how my brain is working these days. Um, things I think about it at midnight. But it helps illustrate my next point. You have to connect with people first before they will give you money. So if you think about it, at its core, fundraising is storytelling multiplied by sharing. 80, 90, 80 to 90% of the funding you receive comes from the traffic you generate from your own marketing efforts. So if you can't get people who know you to donate, you won't convince a stranger. Those mm -hmm. contributions come after connections. And those stories are what help you make those connections. The last thing you want to do is fall into the trap of talking at people. If you remember being in college, your professor would just drone on and on and on, and it, it, you know, it gets the opposite re reaction. So if a student's paying attention and um, you know, connecting with them, they just fell asleep. The last thing you want to do as a nonprofit is to talk at people, when you're trying, especially when you're trying to raise some dollars. So for many, many, many years, nonprofits operated on a one-way communication track. You know, they did all the talking. Um, you told their donors what they needed, and the donors gave us checks. It wasn't really personal. But today, our donors want to feel included. They want to make a difference, and they want their personal donations to matter. So that's why you need to tell stories that bring them into your world and demonstrate their impact. So like storytelling, fundraising is a very human-centered enterprise. Again, people connect with each other, ask each other for help, and create communities. <clears throat> so instead of just talking at people, you want to tell them stories that bring them into your world. This little girl who's just enthralled with the story that her mom or caregiver is reading to her. So if you think about it, you know, most of you probably have annual reports, which are great and needed, but people don't remember the numbers many times, but they will remember a story. Thinking about it right now, many of you probably have a gold mine of stories at your fingertips, which is an unexpected positive from the pandemic. Um, you know, maybe you've got a story of a single mom who just lost her job and has to choose between eating or paying rent. So she swallows her pride and comes through your food line, which is something she's never done before. That's a great story to share with your donors and potential donors because it allows that human connection. It shows the far reaching impact of COVID-19 not affecting people they think would naturally come to your nonprofit, and it provides an immediate connection to how they can help. So when they give money, they see the impact through those stories. So if you give money, it allows us as a nonprofit, you as a nonprofit, to help single recently unemployed moms to be able to feed their children and not have to make unthinkable choices. And of course, there's all kinds of examples out there right now. But you want your fundraising stories to invite the reader in and allow them to see how they can make a direct impact another human being just by giving. So their dollars are valuable just beyond um, thinking about them in terms of numbers. So as we're thinking about why storytelling is effective, one, uh, three points I want you to remember. Stories provide emotion, as we've seen that. They help connect people, whether it's you know, happy, sad, whatever emotion is in between. They connect the reader to your cause. So they give your reader something to identify with. You know, maybe you've got um, whatever you're focused on, whether it's human services or homelessness or um, food insecurity, or whatever the stories can help uh, the general public and your volunteers and donors to really connect. And one thing I think we often tend to forget about with storytelling 
you know, storytelling provides dignity to those you're fundraising for. Um, it, it stops people from judging from afar. A lot of times you'll, you know, you might have a donor come to you, well, they may not come to you, but someone who's seen your organization, thought about giving, but they've got a preconceived idea of the kind of people that you serve. And so your stories help humanize your clients. So think about the person who may see a photo of a woman in a you know, really nice house, and that person thinks, well, I'm not giving money to that nonprofit. They're helping people who don't need it. But when you take that same picture of that woman in her nice house, and you tell her story, and people realize that um, she had an abusive partner, and he, she had to leave with only the clothes on her and her kids' backs, and she doesn't have access to her bank account anymore, and she doesn't have a job yet, and doesn't know where she's gonna live, and the only picture she's got is from her former life, then your potential donors realize that they judged from afar. They didn't know the story behind her. And they realize that by helping you, by giving money to you, they can help people that they had no idea were in situations like these. So think about that. You know, your stories also provide dignity to those that you're fundraising for because it gives a chance for them to have a voice they might, might not have otherwise. All right, so now we've kind of given the the high level view of the importance of storytelling and, and fundraising. What are you gonna do with that knowledge? Well, you wanna find some stories. Um, and like I said, right now, for many of us, there's stories happening all around us. Um, I was with some nonprofits earlier this week and they were just sharing story after story of someone who had you know, come to them for service or um, someone else who had, had given just because a particular uh, issue happening right now touched their heart. So just think about some stories that you can gather. Um, Think about, you know, is there one great story you can use to build an entire campaign? Or do you have multiple stories, micro stories you can use to support your campaign? Um, you know, most people want to help good causes, but we all have a lot going on. So in order to understand something, we need to give it our precious, precious resource, which is our attention. So stories really grab and sustain people's attention, um, giving them the opportunity to really understand what a nonprofit does and why it matters. I've got some examples for you guys. I'll just walk through. So one, um, including the Community Foundation, because this was just a, a great recent example. So Randy um, started in March the Coronavirus Relief Fund because um, he had seen that there were needs coming and we didn't know how long those needs were going to last. And as we see now, it's, you know, indefinite. And so he wanted a way for people to be able to give. Um, we had some money start coming in. But then he had the idea of, well, how can we get the larger public involved? And can we give them something um, in a short amount of time that they could really get their hearts into? And so we came up with this 100K in seven days idea. And so we knew, we knew there's a story. You know, we've got a, a picture here on the left of the lines just snaking out on the co-ops, people waiting for food. And then we've got another co-op with the empty shelves. And so that was kind of the basis for all this. Is we have these stories of these real needs with our co-ops that are happening. And so how do we let other people know, you know, we're in the middle of this pandemic and it's not just affecting me, my neighbor, it's affecting all of us. <clears throat> and so we came up with a 100K in seven days challenge. And this one was a little unique because it was, we had multiple stories to go with it. We had stories not only from our nonprofits, we had stories from our, um, board members who had first accepted the challenge um, and said, yes, we're going to give to this and we want the community to match us. And so Dick and Deb Lopresti, one of the um, board members that jumped in and gave money. And so we used their story about you know, why they had done that, why that was important to them and the fact that they accepted the challenge and they were um, challenging the community to match what they had done. And then we pulled in some of our, our nonprofits and their stories. Um, it's probably too little to read on the screen, so I apologize. But Nancy from PADV um, had a great little story about how the funds had been used to help, um, you know, one of the people at PADV and what a difference that had made. And so, you know, we created some of these little signs that we could send to people and have them take a picture, just, you know, trying to think in these days when we're not together, how can we still be effective with uh, what we're doing? And so this was a success. Not only did we raise 100K, but we actually exceeded it. Um, and then I think the final number was over 115,000 just for that seven days. Of course, the final numbers for the um, coronavirus fund are over a million at this point right now. Um, 
And then with that, we created a follow-up campaign and just, you know, said, thank you. This is the difference you're making. You know, here's some more stories about the difference you're making in all this. And so it really, really connected with people. Um, and then we've got another client that we did earlier um, in, in April. And so they provide home repairs to, um, to seniors who don't have the funds to do home repairs, to foster parents who are trying to renovate their homes to bring in more kids, to those with disabilities. Um, just anyone who just can't afford to do it and really needs some help, um, you know, within a certain uh, area range in Gwinnett. And so we thought, well, what a great time just to focus on, you know, what does home mean to you? Everyone's, you know, sheltering in place. And so, especially for our senior population, having a safe home is even more important than ever. <clears throat> and so, and we knew we had stories to use um, from homeowners talking about uh, just the difference that it had made knowing that you know they weren't going to fall through their flooring or they could step safely out on the porch and walk to their car just things like that but we also wanted to pull in our volunteers and board members and just kind of share some of their stories too and so we created little micro stories we created graphics you know just asked this is one of their board members and we had him in front of his door and just asked him you know what does home mean to you and for him he said it's a place where i feel the greatest community and then we had other stories like this that really um, helped show what home means during this time. And, you know, wrapped it up with a fundraising call to action, of course. And then some of our stories, like this quote we had from a, a lady home they repaired, and um, she just helped, helped drive home to the, those that we were reaching out for funds just to say, you know, if you want to give somewhere, this place is making a difference um, in our lives. And so between, between that, um, campaign that we run, that we ran, that helped really close the gap. Um, this client had a matching uh, grant that they were trying to match the funds to raise. And so this helped, uh, you know, like I said, close the gap to the raise those matching funds that we needed. All right, I am going to pull in, what's my, doing great. Perfect, perfect <laughs> time. So I have a couple of special guests because I want you guys to hear from those who are, you know, boots on the ground, like the Community Foundation and others and just um, ask them a couple questions and have a, a chance to chat with them. So first of all, we are going to hear from um, Kelly, who is Eagle Ranch's Development Director. And we are going to tie her in, Kelly Brewer. All right. She's got a few questions. Yay, there's Kelly. How are you? I'm good. How are y'all? Can you hear me? Yep, we can hear you. Yay. Awesome. Glad to be here. Yay! Thanks for sharing with us and hanging out with us. We appreciate it. You bet. You bet. All right. So Kelly, since we're talking about storytelling, of course, one of my questions is for you is what role does storytelling play in Eagle Ranch's fundraising? Uh, just about everything. <laughs> it's, uh, it's huge. Um, we, you know, we've been around 35 years and I think from day one, our founder, just really made that decision that it's going to be the stories that drive um, drive our fundraising. So where a lot of nonprofits have a lot of different people out fundraising, he made the, the conscious choice to have marketing kind of drive fundraising, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. So just myself and our mm -hmm. executive director, but we do a quarterly newsletter and it's pretty much nothing but stories. Yeah. And the, it just to exactly everything you're saying, I, I don't know if I was on the screen when you were talking, but I was just nodding my head, nodding my head, nodding my head, because, you know, it's one thing to say we're making an impact. And it's another thing to, to see a mom say Eagle Ranch is making an impact. Or it's one thing for us to say, you know, here's all the great reasons why you should give to Eagle Ranch. And it's another thing to have a donor say, this is why I give to Eagle Ranch. I just think people can connect so much more. Um, and it's kind of to that point of, you know, no one likes to be talked at or feel like they're being sold. Um, and stories really, um, it just is a way to do things much more um, genuinely and transparently. And um, so story, storytelling is huge. Awesome, yep. We happen to get your newsletters and they are, they are always, Photography and stories are always great. Yeah. Um, big pictures, right, so, lots, big pictures, lots of words. That's another big yeah. thing. <laughs> you don't want to be too overwhelming if you're telling the story in print. You, you gotta, 
the picture has to tell a lot of the story. So that, yes, that is very true. You can't have 800 words on a page and nobody, got time, for that. nobody got time. Yes. For that. <laughs> I learned that way early in my career. <laughs> All right. So talking about stories, um, what are, what do you look for when you're thinking about stories to help you fundraise? Wow. Um, I think we, you know, we're faith-based. Um, so we're always looking for inspiration, inspirational stories. I think we're always looking for, as much as our stories, like in our newsletters and on Facebook, we want to promote obviously what we're doing and the, maybe the underlying theme is, you know, hopefully it encourages people to give to us. I really think the the bigger thing we want to do is just inspire people. We want to give them hope. Like there is just always hope. You know, if you invite God into it, there is always hope. And so our stories a lot of time revolve around things like that. And even like some of our storytelling is really, um, our founder uh, here recently has been using the story from Nehemiah. Um, in the Bible. And he's talking about, you know, um, cause people are saying, what are you doing? How's it going? And, and again, he's telling a story just to make a point about how we're responding to the crisis and people remember that. So the story is, you know, um, we're really taking our cue from Nehemiah. And the thing about Nehemiah is, you know, they were building this wall and they had all sorts of opposition. So Nehemiah in one hand, he had a sword and he's fighting off all the people that are coming against him. But in the other hand, he is building the wall. And so the, the, the way that this story, it's sort of a metaphor for the times we're all in, right? So, you know, COVID is the sword, you know, it's like, okay, this is a real thing. We've got to deal with this, but we're going to keep building this wall. We're going to move our mission forward. And I have just been amazed when we talk in those terms, um, people can get their head around that really quick. And I think it inspires them to go, that's what we're gonna do too, whether it's in my home with my family or if it's with my for-profit business or my nonprofit, you know, we're gonna keep building our wall and, and we're gonna be on guard about what's going on right now. So that's, that's just one really current example of how a story just like, it's a metaphor, it's a metaphor. And I think anytime you can get your your readers or viewers to identify with a metaphor, it just, it goes a long way. Yeah, that's, that's great. That's perfect. All right. So tips for other nonprofits. Wow. Um, I, I tell you one thing that y'all were talking about that um, really hit home for me was that idea of bringing honor to those you serve. And, um, I'm just thinking about the other nonprofits on the call. Like we, um, you know, we help families that are struggling. We really help children, but you know, it's a result of families that are having a hard time. And so, I mean, if you just get in the shoes of a family that's struggling with a child, you know, it's embarrassing. You know, you're, there's a lot of shame or guilt or I'm not doing something right. And we work really hard, um, to remove that. As a matter of fact, we position when a family comes to Eagle Ranch, like that is the most courageous thing you can do. To say I need help, to say my child needs help, that's the most courageous thing. So I just would want to challenge everybody, for, you know, when you're looking at these stories, like anything you can do to get people to identify with it, anything that you can do that if someone's reading it that needs your services, that you make it okay for them. Like the enemy loves nothing more than to isolate us and tell us we're the only ones that struggle, we're the only ones that have problems, and that's just a lie. So it's, it's about, again, back to that transparency and um, just back to, to, to being real. And, and I think, um, Heather, one of the first things you said was just, you know, having a lot of grace there, there is not enough grace in the world these days. So I think anytime you tell stories that have humility and grace, um, people really appreciate that. Mm -hmm. Those are, those are good words. Spot on. Yeah. Just, yeah. Especially in our world today, just to be the light. Yeah. Yeah. Truly. I mean, it sounds kind of corny, but it, it, 
and it resonates. I mean, people, people are looking for that. They really are. So if you can be a light, you know, in a dark corner, that's a, that's a good thing for, for them. And it's a good thing for your ministry or your nonprofit. So. Awesome. Well, Kelly, thank you. Thanks so much for hanging out with us and, and sharing loving your work. This. I'm God. loving this. This is great. Thank you. Awesome. Well, thank you. All right. We are going to transition over and with our, to our next guest, Melanie Connor, who is the executive director of Rainbow Village. Hey, Melanie. Hi, how are you? How are you? Good. I'm not sure why I'm here. You guys have already answered all the questions and <laughs> shared everything. So. But you, like Kelly, y'all, you guys are boots on the ground. You're the ones living this out every single day. So it's a privilege to get to hear from you and your perspective. Um, all right. So Melanie, a couple of the same questions for you too. So talk about storytelling and what role that plays when you're doing fundraising for um, Rainbow Village. Yeah, so, um, you know, like Kelly said, it is everything. I mean, the stories are the, the thing that sell, um, if I can use that language, that is what people want to know. It's not just about the statistics or any of those kinds of things, but re what's really going on with the families and the children and how are they, you know, how are things being improved in their lives? And so um, it is the, the crux of how we do what we do um, by sharing the fam those stories and then... <laughs> getting uh, a response as well. <laughs> the dog we likes love to Oh my gosh, I thought I was going to be sorry. <laughs> yeah, I'll, right, I'll end on that note with the dog, yeah. <laughs> All right, so um, what do you look oh, for? Heather, can I jump in with a question for sure. Melanie? Can I try to yep. stump the star? So Melanie, over the last four four months, right, since this started, um, have you changed your approach in, in marketing and communicating to your constituents and to your donors? Yes, uh, we've changed in some ways. Uh, a, a lot of what we're doing is actually trying to communicate more often mm -hmm. so that we make sure that they know, hey, we're still here, we're still operating, we're still helping families, we still need your help. Um, you know, so a monthly newsletter has now turned into some, you know, making sure that we're updating our Facebook and Instagram and all of it, LinkedIn, all of that on a much more regular basis, telling more stories in those ways, doing more video kinds of things. We are um, also starting to do, I'm doing for some of our donors, uh, a little video text that I send to them personally, you know, hey, Sabrina, I really appreciate what you've done. I mean, so just trying to make sure that we are continually reaching out because even though we're virtual, um, the work we're doing isn't virtual, it's very real, and we try to make sure that they know that. So, yeah, we're yeah. doing So, you didn't go radio stuff. silent, you stayed story based. You yeah. segmented your market. So, you're you as CEO, and I've seen some of your your video messages that have you done, done um, you know, one, you know, very honest, right? That you came right. across about here's, here's our name, and you guys are a transitional housing, right? You're not on the front, you're not food, you're not healthcare, you're not on that front line of COVID. Right. Uh, but, you know, as we all know, this, this thing rolls through and impacts every one of us, right? And it's going to continue rolling. So you didn't, again, you didn't go radio silent. You went the opposite way. You upped the message, stayed story based, segmented it into your market, was real to your community about right. these are our needs, right? We still have these kids. We still have these families. Exactly. They are hurting just like yours, you know, so, you know, um, so Kudos to you guys. Loved watching what, what you were doing because a lot of yeah. people just went, I, I can't I can't compete with the food banks. I can't compete with healthcare. I can't. You can because you got a centerpiece of people that really, really care about what you do, right? And then you build your way out from there. So Yeah, well, and then our families, you know, were already the the lowest. Uh, on the totem pole in many ways. And so they were already experiencing homelessness and domestic violence and all those things and poverty. They were living in a lot of this. And so all of these families, a lot of these families who are now experiencing it for the first time, this is the way our families were living. Um, and so they were impacted even more in some instances than, you know, than, than the average, I will say, family. So yeah, we wanted to make sure that people knew that the needs were still great and they didn't go away because of this. Yeah, I remember you guys did your own COVID front in the beginning. We did. And I think, and so we, right. we, stole, we borrowed, I shouldn't say stole, we borrowed that idea from the Community Foundation. 
Um, and actually we did a, initially we started with $10,000 in 10 days. That was our initial goal. And we got one donor who gave us $10,000. So we're like, woo. Um, and then we, <laughs> we decided to expand that and we went to uh, try and do $100,000 in 30 days and we raised $118,000 um, in go. those 30 days. And so that was a fantastic, you know, I mean, uh, just an, yep. an overwhelming outpouring of love from the community. And it was, it was fantastic. We, we really, yep. um, it was right. surprising. Yeah, we did. All those yeah. At the same time. Yeah, yeah, we did the same thing. We started with 300,000. And I just kept moving the carrot, 300,000. Yeah, okay, you hit that. Yeah. Let's try a half a million. Okay, let's, let's try, yeah, you know, a million. A million. <laughs> right, yeah, and keep moving the carrot, you know, <laughs> you know, keep telling the story. Okay. Yeah. Thanks, Amanda and Heather, for letting me jump in. I try to be <laughs> quiet welcome. on these things, but it's really hard. <laughs> I know. It's, I know, it's hard. All right, Melanie, last question in the interest of time. Um, when it comes to fundraising and storytelling, any tips for our non other nonprofits who are watching? Yeah, I would say, you know, just be relatable. I, I think the stories have to be relatable. They have to uh, resonate with people. It has to mean something to them. Um, you know, either something that they want to do to make the world better or something that they may have been through themselves, whatever. Um, I would say, you know, we've started kind of developing a story bank because we uh, know that we need to be able to, all of the, 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 for, you know, the, the people that go into the public, myself, the development director, community folks, we need to be able to have some stories kind of in our quiver to be able to pull out. We're very fortunate because we deal with families, so we can get, talk about adults if we want to talk about that, and talk about the kids if you want to talk about that. So, you know, whatever we find, whatever the person's interest is, that's where we try to kind of pull the story. Um, and then I think, you know, two other things I think that are, are important, I kind of jotted those down while I was listening, but one is to go back and give an update. If you told a story about somebody, you know, previously, maybe go back later and give an update on that. Like we did a story at a, uh, in our impact statement at the end of the year about a young lady who had left a situation of domestic violence, came to Rainbow Village and dreamed of home ownership. And now when we go back and tell that story, she actually just moved into her own house um, three weeks ago. So, uh, you know, she, that's a real, that we, that's something that we can say, hey, not only did she dream of this, we helped her make that dream come true. And, and this is how your support helps other families do that. And so, um, you know, just had a ribbon cutting, y'all see pictures if you follow us on Facebook or anything like that of her and, uh, and her story. And then the last thing I think is, uh, two last things real quickly. One is, I try to make sure that program staff is on board with this. They work directly with the um, residents and they know and hear more about it. And so they have to know how important their role is in getting those stories out to us um, because they are not always the ones that's going out talking to the public, but we need to know uh, more about it. And then the opposite of that is on my development side and community engagement side. I encourage them to go talk to the residents. They tell their stories the best. Um, and if they talk to them, then they have firsthand knowledge of what their feelings were, what they experienced, they could ask more questions. And so when they're telling the story and when I'm telling the story, it's much better when I have talked to the resident rather than me getting it from somebody else. So that's, that's it. Those are awesome tips, Melanie. Mm -hmm. just, thank you. Thanks for sharing your knowledge and just being really relevant. We really appreciate it. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. All right, I'm going to turn this over to Amanda, and she's going to segue us into the next portion of our webinar. All right. Thank you, everyone. Passing the reins, moving the technology. All right, we're ready now. Okay, so Heather talked to you about storytelling and finding those stories. So that's great. And but then what do you do with them? So I'm going to use the second half of this to start talking specifically about content strategy. So taking those stories and actually starting to be able to do something with them. Um, I'm going to go ahead. You should have received a worksheet in the meet in the um, in an email from Carol K this morning. Uh, I am going to get go ahead and post a link in the chat just in case you didn't have it or you don't want it and you want to follow along. Um, so you guys can click on that if you want to get, have this to take notes or work through. So just want to kind of give you a well, PSA right there to start you off. All right, so if you, if anybody's ever listened to any of our other uh, webinars that we've ever done, you'll know that one of our big soapboxes is having a plan um, and why that is so critical. 
And that becomes even more important when you have a story, just like Melanie was sharing. She has a whole story bank. So how do you start to actually use them? Oh, hold on a second. There we go. Um, and so I want to start with, sorry for that, um, a little bit of a, an, another story. I want to share a story that, that I got to participate with Leadership Gwinnett. We're trying to do as many nonprofit COVID-based stuff right now because some amazing things have really come out of this. So for those of you who don't know about Leadership Gwinnett, they are a 30 plus year old leadership institute in, in Gwinnett and they, their purpose is to educate, equip, and engage diverse leaders and inspire civic involvement. So what better tool do we need right now than good, strong leaders who are educated, equipped, and engaged to move the needle on this? So what happened is I was a part of the organization at that time, and they have been doing these events for over 30 years. For 30 years, they've been doing all day in-person events. And at the beginning of COVID, two weeks before their last in-person event of the season, everything got shut down. Um, so what do you do as an institution who has based their entire strategy on being in person? Because of so much of this content strategy stuff that I'm gonna talk you guys through, I'll interject what actually happened, but you know, we had to figure out how to go virtual very, very quickly. So keep, so we'll, we'll come back to that a little bit, but just want you to be thinking about how do you take your content and pivot it? If you have a good foundation, you can do that. So we'll try to make it easy, it's three steps. Three steps to getting your content, to actually having a plan that you can execute. Step one, set goals. Step two, set milestones. And then step three is, this says plan your month because this structure that I'm giving you, you guys could use for ongoing content. You can also easily cycle this into an event or a specific fundraising campaign. So I kind of left that in there because I want you guys to know that this is something that you can just continually use. It's a really good, easy framework. So I want to start with the first step is setting goals. And this is a absolute critical piece of it. And so if you guys are looking and following along with your worksheet, you are on the first page of it. Um, so we're gonna start by, you need to have some very specific goals for your team when you're starting to do this. Um, on your worksheet, I went ahead and put this in here as a good reference for you guys. The way that goals work is if they're actually good goals and not everybody, and, and it's a true skill to work on writing goals. Um, and so I give you this, this better, I think it's a better acronym than just the SMART goals, but smarter goals. And they need to be specific. So it needs to be very doable. Seven, you know, $100,000 in seven days. That is a very specific goal right there. Um, it's measurable. We know how much money and in how long. Um, actionable. We know that we're trying to raise money. It's risky. Hey, it's a little bit outside that comfort zone. It's something you haven't necessarily done before. If your goal isn't risky enough, you'll put it off and put it off and won't engage. It has to be outside that comfort zone. Time keep, seven days. Exciting. This is one that we really forget when we're trying to set goals. Is so often we'll try to set a goal that doesn't necessarily have that energy behind it. And so this is, this is why I like this acronym for it better because if you're not excited about it, how are you gonna get your donors and volunteers and clients to get behind that piece of it. So think about that. And the final one is relevant. What is going to be actually applicable for your stage of, of life of your organization or even COVID? <laughs> what is actually going to work in the in this kind of situation? So if you have those clear goals, that makes such a very specific difference. So it gave you a little space to write out some long-term goals, but then also break it down into shorter term. So give yourself, take those longer term goals and, and break it into, you know, two to three that you want to accomplish in in a quarter because you want to have a bigger goal and make sure that you're you're following that process and, and and you're not just picking up one little thing at a time you know it's really easy during a crisis to get short-sighted and be like oh i need to have money for this and lose track of that big mission and so this exercise here just helps you hold on to that a couple other steps that go into this that i like to just define so you guys have some clarity around it is you want to determine what your calls to action are and so this is a little bit different than what your offer is, which I'll touch on in a second. But this is actually what you want people to do for you. Do you want them to donate? Do you want them to call? Do you want them to go to the website? Do you want them to engage? Think about the action that you want. The good thing about call to action is once you establish these, these don't typically change, but it really helps if you understand that 
experience that you're asking people to go through. If you're asking them to call, you know, what is it like when they actually call through? Does everybody who's on the phone have that same story that they need to, do they have the, uh, you know, the right forms ready to fill out? Do they, are they trained? So it really helps to think through that to streamline that process. That's how you can raise, you know, a million dollars so quickly is it was really easy. And some of the stuff you guys already have in place, but this is also just a good refresher of, is that process as easy as it can be for people to engage with you? All right, so once you have the call to action, then you have the specific offer. So what is that? So in donating, a great example of what this is, if you're, if you're having sponsors for some type of event, you know, what, what are they getting? Are they getting um, recognition on your website? Are they getting called on their social media? Um, or if you're asking for donor donations to actually support, you know, just your operations of it of like $20 buys five books to get in the hands of kids. So be really specific about what they're getting. And it's a little different for you as nonprofits because they're not necessarily getting a tangible piece, but it could be the story that they're getting. Or it could be that, okay, that feeling that they're getting because they really help, you know, they put groceries in two families uh, kitchens for the next uh, you know, two weeks, that kind of a thing. So really thinking about what that is. So you know what that, what your, your donor is really going to feel as they're going through that process. Okay. So set goals. Now step two is setting milestones. So this is really important. There are so many things that we are doing differently right now that we have never done before. So it's really good to check in and see how you're doing. So in your uh, worksheet, I gave you guys just some different ways to uh, start to measure and most of what I gave you are uh, digital uh, marketing ways to measure but you could easily pivot this and change that list of channels that I have on there into something that's more applicable to what you need. Um, it could be a number of registrations, it could be dollars raised. Um, so that's just an important part. So I went ahead, I'm just pulling up just a website just so you can see because most of you have websites and you should be tracking that. And your website is your hub. So if you're running a campaign, your website is a great piece for you to be keeping eyes on. Because if you launch a campaign and your web chat does nothing, that might be something you wanna go in and look at. And that's the whole point of doing measurement and milestone and thinking about that before you start is then you're ready for something not to be exactly what you expected it to. There's a lot of expectations that we just don't have right now because a lot of things we've never done before. So this just helps you be prepared to pivot throughout that process. So just make it easy. In your left column, just put whatever thing you wanna track. You wanna give some type of metric for, um, in this case, I'm looking at, at with the website, the last 12 months, we wanna see what traffic was, and then we wanna compare it to the previous 12 months. And you can go smaller. In COVID world, we might wanna look at like a three month or even a one month process. Um, but then you wanna look at the difference and then just give yourself a space to write some goals. So if something didn't grow and it's not where you want it to be, this is a great space to either work with your team, if you pull in a, you wanna work with a marketer, say, okay, this isn't hitting the mark, what do we wanna do about it? So that just makes it really easy for you to communicate and have everybody on the same page. Okay. So that's what you're measuring. Then you wanna have milestones. You wanna, don't wanna just check in at the end of the campaign. If you check in at the end of the campaign, you can't really do anything if something didn't go right. So setting those milestones throughout the process is really critical. So I gave you guys a quick little questionnaire in there to help you start this process with your team. So you wanna check in how often do you wanna report the progress or the results? Are you checking weekly? If you're doing a seven day campaign, you probably wanna check in daily. You wanna look, you wanna assign very specifically who's in charge of pulling those reports. You wanna say how a report shared with your team, are you just sending it to an email? Are you having a meeting? So think about what that process is. You want to see what stats are you pulling and how do you get those stats so if it's fundraising that's that's easy you're looking at the money coming in through hopefully your online uh cart and so that would be just checking on a regular basis but make sure it's easy to pull and if you're delegating that to another team member that they know how to do it and you're getting accurate numbers also want to just delegate how do you want to collect feedback from your team so uh and i'll show share with you guys an after action review in a little bit of like how do you help streamline that process? Because we don't know how long this is gonna last. So if you do a fundraiser right now for the next seven days, you might need to do it again in six weeks. And it'd be really nice if you can just dust off this process and then improve those little pieces that weren't quite as smooth so that it's better and better each time you do this. And then finally, you wanna decide who's in charge of feedback revisions and making it happen. So you get feedback from your team, great. 
how do you make sure it's going to happen? So just taking a little bit of time up front to think through that is so critical when we're talking about long-term strategies. That's why I said, like, we use this for monthly planning. We use it for events. You can use it for anything. These are just good tried and true practices. All right. Final step is actually planning. So first up is you want to choose the type of content that you're going to do. We find this is a lot easier than starting with your channels. Start with, we're going to do, uh, maybe you're going to do a Zoom event and you're going to do it through, you know, promote it through social media and you're going to promote it through email. So pick those specific channels or I'm sorry, the content pieces first before you get into the channels. Because a lot of times you might recycle your content on multiple, multiple social medias or that just gives you a little bit better way to think through this as a content exercise. That's what we're focusing on today. So then I also gave you guys a table. So you fill in that content type. So for instance, here we have a virtual event and we're going to use email and we're going to have some website updates. You probably will have more columns. I'm just sticking to three for the, just, just for this exercise. So with that virtual event, you want to go ahead and underneath it, you want to put what your content ideas are. You want to share COVID support updates. You want to share client case studies. And then you also want to share what need is more in there. What, what need, need you need more. There's a lot of needs in there. Um, so, but that's what you want to be thinking about there. And then you drill down and you do more specific. So you're going to have some promotional video. You're going to have a Zoom event. And then you're probably going to have a presentation with it. And you probably, that list is much longer. Um, and the same thing for email. You want to break down each type of these content. So it really starts to help you map out what this is going to look like. All right. So I want to do a little PSA in here because one thing that's really great to do is what we call a pre-pre-launch. And we borrow this idea from Jeff, Jeff Walker and his book, Launch. And what you want to be able to do is before you commit to a big campaign, and I'm saying bigger campaigns, so this could be like end of your giving or if you're doing something, like we can't always do that when we're acting really quickly now. But as we kind of find our new normal, this is a practice that I want to make sure is in your head as you're going through this. But a pre-pre-launch is, is a way to be able to collect feedback from your audience through some type of like poll or survey, phone call, feedback box, anything like that, just to be able to make sure your audience actually is on board with it. And it does a couple things. One, it kind of sets the stage for something is coming, but it also gives you a chance to understand what that real need is. So you can craft that message. So if you have questions about like, I don't know what they care about or what's important to them, this is a great way to be able to do it. And it can be very fast. You guys can send out a survey on Monday and ask for feedback by Wednesday or Thursday and use that to craft your campaign the next week. Like it doesn't have to be this big elaborate thing, but that's just something to really think about. Um, and I'm going to share these slides with you. So you guys, will, you guys will have this recording. You'll end up having the slides afterwards. But there's a bunch of questions. There's 10 questions that through the, this book that we're sharing. So I'm just giving you a little snippet because I know you guys are busy enough as it is. Of what you want to start, these are good questions to ask as you're looking at a campaign. So it's trying to make sure, because you don't want this to come off as selling something. You really want to come across with that care. And so these questions just help you get through and think about that process. So this is a great one to do on your own, especially if you're stuck and how do you really want to have that level of compassion. So this is just a great resource that I want to make sure is in everybody's hands. All right. So in-person events. These really aren't a thing right now. <laughs> and that's okay. <laughs> and so I want to just share, go a little bit more back to share a little bit about what, what leadership went at, what happened with us. And so basically we went from eight hour uh, in-person events and we knew we had two weeks to pivot. And the question was, could we and should we? And we decided, knowing what our main goal as an organization was, that we needed to equip leaders and that absolutely we needed to show up. We had some amazing people in that class. It was 40 leaders who are having to step up in ways that they had never had to step up before. So the answer to that question was, yes, they need support. So we took the time to make sure that we were not inappropriate and that basically we scratched our entire day <laughs> and we redid the whole thing. We had all of our, uh, probably about four months in advance, had everything lined up, all of the speakers book. And then we basically went back to them and said, hey, which of these speakers is going to be the most critical during this period and which one maybe we just hold until next year. We reached out to everybody and then we made sure we asked the ones that we thought would be most critical to come back and say, hey, can you pivot? 
one of which was we asked Dr. Dan Kaufman to say, hey, you know, with your military background, you know crisis probably better than most people in this community. Can you please give us a crisis management uh, a presentation? And he said, absolutely. And in three days, <laughs> he had a new presentation ready for us. And it was absolutely fantastic. It's one of those moments you just kind of trust. Never done anything like this before. This was, uh, just give you a timeline. So this happened on, on April 8th. So three weeks into the shutdown. This was super early. Everybody was still trying to figure out Zoom or what even Zoom was. So I share that with you because I think it's important to, to think about what is now possible. And the result from that was everybody showed up. We had key leaders from some of, you know, hospitals, many healthcare organizations who were there that day, who had other things that they were trying to figure out, but still showed up for that process. And in addition to that, so a little bit longer term, you know, Leadership Gwinnett is now once again, still looking at how do we do this virtually? And we're really concerned about what enrollment would look like this year. And everybody who, who they offered the position to accepted, and they have a full class going into this year as well as launching an entirely new webinar series where they were bringing in key alumni who could share critical information out to that other group of leaders. So this not only helped that class, but then launched into a whole alumni program for about a thousand different leaders in our community to get the information out that needed to. So content strategy, if you have that, it makes it really easy to be able to pivot. You can't do this unless you have those good goals and that good measurement and milestones in place to be able to quickly pivot that content. But because those were so clear, we were able to do that. And so I want to end with, with just a question with this is, you know, hearing that and have, a, have such an institution that had such a long standing tradition, what does the pandemic make possible? And so think about that in your organization. What does that really change? We heard from both with Kelly and Melanie, as well as there, there was a lot of different things that were, are new for both of them uh, in their organizations because of the pandemic that was not available six months ago. So that's just something to really hold on to going through this process. So instead of in-person events, go back to our regularly scheduled program, there's some great new tools. Zoom, we're doing it now with breakout groups, which we'll do in just a couple minutes. Um, there's also YouTube and Facebook Live options so that you can broadcast and record immediately. Google Hangouts has done a whole new version of it. And let me just tell you the amount of different technology that's popped up that I'm now learning about, that this is a very short list. But just get creative. There's a lot of different ways to engage uh, with people. I have one more soapbox because we're a branding and marketing firm and branding is so critical. Consistency is key. Now is not necessarily the time to do a full on rebrand and get that out there because what's happening is you don't want to, you don't want people not to recognize you. That doesn't mean that you don't change things up and it doesn't mean that you don't evolve your brand, but don't drop or lose it. Cause there's this great stat that I love to share with people that Americans are exposed to anywhere between 4,000 and 10,000 ads per day. That is a lot of ads and you need to be able to cut through that. So you need to be recognizable very quickly. People have been on social media so much more and they're scrolling really fast. And if they're scrolling fast, they don't, you don't want them to miss you because you didn't have that brand in place. So you know, I'll get off my soapbox, but I just wanted to remind everybody of that. All right, so if you're ready to launch, just do what you do best, speak from the heart. And I wanna give you just a couple little pointers before we break out into some breakout sessions. So the first step, measure and adjust. We're all learning new things. Don't be afraid to scrap something if you need to. If it is not working, change it. Stop doing it. Also celebrate. You know, some of the things, if it didn't work, you might not have hit the goal that you wanted, but you still made progress. So make sure you're celebrating the gains and not just, just dwelling on the gaps that are created. Also, you wanna do a review. And so this, I was alluding to this earlier. This is an after action review. We borrow this from the Army. Army has to work really fast, so it's a great way to use this in a crisis. And it's just three simple questions to ask. What worked? What didn't work? And then we have a new KISS acronym, which I love. What would you keep? What would you improve? What would you start? And what would you stop? And this can be a very quick process. It's a great, a great exercise just to build into your just normal workflow for your operational procedures, your marketing, anything. I'm giving you guys a lot of stuff that you can just use for just everyday use, but it's so critical. Also remember, it's about making connections. 
and take the time to talk to your audience, hear what they're thinking and feeling. Don't get so caught up in the digital and that we have to, you know, we're distancing from everybody that you forget to engage with all of those sides. And then research, borrow ideas from others. We already heard that. Borrowing ideas from the Community Foundations program, great, do it. Um, engage with your audience, your audience is different. We're all trying to figure out new things. And finally, don't be afraid to take a risk because you never know what it's gonna turn into and the great success that it's gonna be. So be bold in the format. We are gonna open up for just a few minutes of questions while we get the breakout rooms set up. Um, so I'm gonna check out and see if anybody has posted and if you guys wanna post some questions on, on the group chat, feel like it. I don't think we see any. Well, if we don't have any, we're just gonna go into our breakout sessions. Um, so the way we have this broken out is we have, do you break it to four or three? Mm. Okay, all right, we're gonna do three breakout sessions. So we're automatically gonna divide you up with our group. Uh, we're going to basically meet until the end of the session. Um, we're not gonna come back together. If you can't, it was great having you today. <laughs> Um, and before we actually break off, we do want to do a nice little plug for the Good to Give celebration. So talking about uh, taking risks, doing something different, doing something uh, that's very digital, we're going to do the Good to Give celebration. And it is going to be house parties. So we are going to do a live broadcast. Um, so for everybody who loves coming to this summer tradition, we have not gotten rid of it by any means. So keep up with that. If you want more information, please just visit uh, cfneg.org and you can sign up to have a house party. All right. Are you ready to break this out? Almost. Okay. With that, while we're moving everybody around, uh, I do want to say thank you for everybody who's attending. And um, for our contact information, we have it up. So you have rock, paper, scissors, that's me. Uh, just email help at 123shoot.com or go to 123shoot.com. And for Heather, it's Magnolia Media Group. You go to stories at magnoliamedia.group or visit magnoliamedia.group. We are, we are here to support you to make your organization stronger. And so with that, we are looking forward to doing this. So I'm going to pause this for a second and we'll get everybody broken out and we will be breaking out in just a moment.